now. Uh, the, we will pr proceed with the lecture in the following way. First, our lecture will, lecturer will present today's topic for us. Questions prepared by the organizing team will follow the presentation. And in the end, audience questions are appreciated. You are welcome to use Zoom's chat tool to post your questions, but you are also welcome to ask your questions by opening your microphone and camera if you wish to do so. So welcome to this year's third Leadership for Change lecture. The Leadership for Change lectures bring together skillful leaders with experience in dealing with change. Today's societal challenges are complex and change processes require joint efforts of different sectors of society. The Leadership for Change lectures are brought to you by Tampere University's master's degree program in Leadership for Change. Today, we are honored to have Venla Ruth as our guest lecturer. She works at the Ministry of Justice as the anti-trafficking coordinator and serves the whole Finnish government. Previously, Venla has served as a team leader at the Office for the Non-Discrimination Ombudsman, where she was responsible for leading the work against human trafficking and promoting foreigners, including undocumented people, asylum seekers, refugees, rights in Finland. She also holds a PhD in law. Currently, Venla is leading the process of drafting the cross-sectoral national plan of action against human, against trafficking in human beings, NAP in short, together with the interministerial working group and non-governmental organizations. Her work also includes supporting other ministries and authorities to implement the government program, which provides measures to prevent trafficking and other forms of exploitation, assist and protect trafficked persons and investigate trafficking offenses. Thus, we are eager to learn more about this complex societal challenge and who would be better to discuss how social change can be achieved using anti-trafficking work as an example than Venla Ruth. Please let us warmly welcome to the stage, Venla Ruth. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind in intro introduction and, and thank you for the invitation uh, to discuss with you today about human trafficking. So I try to share my screen. Just a minute. So are you able to see this now? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So, so when I prepared for this lecture, I thought that you could be interested in, actually in at, at least in two uh, different but interrelated issues. First, I thought that I might uh, tell you something about what trafficking actually is. So when we talk about human trafficking, what is important to understand and what are the topics that I am on uh, my daily work constantly uh, discussing with those people who actually work in the field, uh, help victims of human trafficking and try to get uh, investigations further and so on and so forth. So what is human trafficking all about? And the second uh, section of this lecture is about the change. So how the change in human trafficking issues can be made so that the complexity of the whole issue can be taken addition, you know, um, actually into account. Um, so I think that I try to, and I try to keep this lecture short so that we have uh, time to discuss and change views. Uh, because I see that these kind of lectures are also opportunities for myself to learn uh, more from, from you. So I hope that this, this, is, this is, uh, sounds feasible for you. So, 
trafficking in human beings is an issue which has uh, appeared in the Finnish media, uh, should I say, strongly than ever before. Even though trafficking in human beings has been discussed in the media previously, I probably it's is it's um, it's uh, it's okay to say that now this change has happened. And there are many reasons for that, uh, I would say, and maybe we come back to that later. Probably you have, uh, um, these are the headlines from the Helsing in Sanomat, uh, and, um, and how this uh, trafficking in human beings has been discussed in the media uh, there. So I guess most of you at least have uh, come across with uh, the Babo Teitinen's uh, journalist uh, long and rather detailed article on Nepalese restaurant and how the exploitation of foreign workers actually takes place in Finland, how the dynamics works and, and so on and so forth and, and what is the situation of the vulnerable victims uh, in Finland as well. Uh, you have probably heard about that, uh, also the discussion that uh, it is uh, the exploiting foreign workers is fairly risk-free in Finland. This has been criticized uh, and uh, by by different experts, and and it has been uh, stated that especially difficult is that the consequences actually are directed uh, more to the exploited workers than those who actually exploit the workers. Uh, Finnish assistance system, which is uh, uh, authority responsible for assisting victims of human trafficking, has uh, communicated uh, after year and, uh, and year that the number of assisted victims of human trafficking has increased. And last year, the, the number of victims actually set a record of, of for admissions, so the number was higher than ever before. But then you have probably heard also that the government has, has also tried to figure out uh, and find ways uh, how trafficking issue can be tackled. And for example, uh, uh, just in, in February, start, uh, in the beginning of February, actually police uh, set up a, a task force on human trafficking in order to investigate trafficking cases uh, even um, more efficiently than, than, than uh, previously. So, so this, is, this is the situation where we are living. At the same time, and I have to say that this has not always been the, this, this way. Uh, to be honest, uh, we know that trafficking issue is, is one of those societal issues which hasn't been easy uh, to really to, to combat uh, in Finland, but it's not easy you know, anywhere in the world. And what I'm saying is that uh, um, I've been working with anti-trafficking issues a bit uh, less than 20 years. And, and when I started, trafficking issue was not discussed either in media or, you know, nor anywhere, really. So uh, in the government or, you know, uh, anywhere. So uh, trafficking was kind of a considered as an issue which not really concerned Finland. Uh, trafficking was 20 years ago, for example, you know, it was said that that Finland is uh, at most a transit country for trafficking. Uh, we don't have trafficking happening in Finland. We are not a destination country, let alone a country of origin for victims of human trafficking. This has changed, I see, you know, in this in the course of 20 years and the change has been really remarkable, I would say. So what is human trafficking all about? When we talk about human trafficking, I see that it is important for you to understand how this operates. 
you know what is what actually happens when we when we talk about human trafficking so human trafficking it can be related to sexual exploitation for example forcing someone into prostitution or uh, or uh, uh, exploitation in the sex industry for example in pornography industry striptease industry uh, you know it can be very uh, you know it can vary a lot you know how this uh, sexual exploitation uh, you know uh, happens and why it happens uh, this 50% uh, here uh, illustrates the number uh, of internationally uh, identified victims of human trafficking. So 50% of internationally, um, according to the UN numbers, the United Nations numbers, the 50% of the victims are sexually exploited. Uh, the, the, the second largest uh, uh, form of exploitation is uh, labor exploitation and, and forced labor. And here we talk about very different way of exploiting person, you know, people, but we can come back to that later, if you will. Anyways, that is 38% of the overall number of identified victims internationally. Then the smaller numbers, you know, relate to forced marriage, forced adoption, uh, forced begging and forced criminal activity. And I stop here for a minute. Criminal activities relate to that kind of activity uh, where the trafficked persons are forced to commit crimes, uh, for example, petty crimes, even, even uh, 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 smuggle uh, drugs or something similar. So, so they are forced to do that. Uh, and, and all this money which is generated from this criminal activity uh, uh, it flows to those who actually exploit the victims. Then, of course, you know, this trade in human organs and tissues take place, but we don't know many of those cases actually in Finland, but internationally this takes place to a certain extent. So, this is just to illustrate how the numbers of, of, of assistance system uh, has actually you know, developed. Uh, when we started and when the assistance system was, was actually kind of a, a developed, uh, the numbers were really, really small. So really small. A handful of victims actually um, you know, were kind of a uh, uh, referred to the assistance system, but now the numbers are completely different. And what I'm seeing is that, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily say that victims of human trafficking or the number of victims of trafficking is increasing in Finland. Uh, it can, of course, tell something about that. But I'm, I, I, I'd rather say, I'd rather say that it's about, you know, what we are doing. It's about the, the, you know, the better identification, better assistance, uh, better investigations, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, the consequence uh, is that the victims of human trafficking uh, and their number is increasing. I, I, I think uh, most of the numbers can be, can be kind of a uh um can be related to that reason but of course it can be also that, that the actual business of human trafficking is increasing in finland as well so where does trafficking take place the crime can be related to international local organized crime operations so it can be organized crime related but it can also be about single employer or even a victim's family member. It can be boyfriend or a lover, you know, who actually uh, uh, recruits a person and exploits her. Uh, this is what we know, uh, know uh, uh, more and more about, uh, that actually those who are close to the victims uh, uh, exploit these uh, people. Uh, trafficking can take place uh, uh, across borders, so uh, victim may be trafficked to another country for exploitation, uh, or it can take place within a single country. In Finland, we know uh, several cases already where uh, the both victims and the perpetrators have been Finnish citizens. 
So it can also trafficking uh, take place domestically. So it can be so-called domestic trafficking. And what is important to understand is that people may fall victims to human trafficking in their home country and home town. And uh, not all victims of human trafficking are foreigners. Uh, also, those people who are, you know, Finnish citizens or who stay legally in the country with permanent or continuous residence permit can fall victims of human trafficking. Not all, all victims of human trafficking are undocumented or, so, or, or this kind, you know, have this kind of a status. Uh, this is also important to know and understand. So how does it happen? And this is something I would like to uh, and uh, to really talk about uh, 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 in a more depth way. The thing is that you know this is this is actually what I wrote my PhD about. So what is you know how does this really happen? How is it possible that something like this takes place? We usually think that trafficking is kind of an instant action that you know something exploited and something somebody ex exploited and 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 you know in 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 something uh, in you know somewhere and and by some some um, someone, but this is not how it takes place and how it happens usually. We can have those cases as well where people are kind of locked up and you know in in some kind of an apartment and they are not able to move out you know move uh, around and so on and so forth this can take place but usually victims of human trafficking uh, actually are you know um, in a so in a in a so vulnerable situation that they can't really uh, uh, get out of the of the of, of the exploitative uh, conditions uh, so they, you know, the traffickers, uh, like um, with mens rea, you know, they really know what they are doing. They exploit their victims' vulnerability and dependency on on them. So there can be something like, uh, uh, for example, what we know that you know people have. Uh, mental problems, they have economic problems, uh, they are, you know, uh, dependent on their employer, uh, they live in isolation uh, somewhere where, you know, they don't have any idea where they are, uh, they don't have language skills, uh, you know, all, all these kinds of issues, they don't have any networks in Finland, for example, or, you know, so it's about, you know, uh, this kind of a long process during which the victim gradually falls under the offender's control. Um, and what is important to understand also is that the longer the exploitation continues and the more vulnerable and traumatized the victim is, the harder it is for him or her to leave the situation uh, without outside help. So why does trafficking happen? So I have, you know, there are multiple, you know, reasons for this. Uh, this is really complex phenomenon, and, and it is very difficult to to say that, you know, you know, all the reasons why this happens. But I have now listed here few of them, uh, which I think are um, probably at least uh, what I think the most important. So we talk about, you know, of course, we talk about like economic, uh, social economic issues, which relate to poverty uh, and, and uh, inequality. So we talk about like uh, structural issues in the society. We talk about corruption. We talk about that kind of issues, which kind of make it easier for the traffickers to really to exploit uh, different persons and people and move them around and 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 profit from from them. Uh, but at the same time, when we talk about those countries where the victims of human trafficking might come, for example, from from you know from different countries, we have to talk about like inequality structures also in our country. So we have to think, you know, what probably generates trafficking also in Finland. This is not something that we have, you know, we are able to, you know, to let, you know, uh, to those countries to to decide and solve. But also we have to think, you know, what we could do better. So and this relates, for example, to the demand and to the attitudes. So. 
in the countries of, uh, of destination, uh, you know, we kind of have, uh, we create demand for these services that human, you know, victims of human trafficking uh, produce. So, for example, we buy different products and different kind of like um, food and, and stuff. And also we buy sex from different people who actually Actually, might be victims of human trafficking. So we, in a way, create demand for this kind of illegal business. And also, what I see is, is this kind of an attitudes, you know, and and all these kind of things, you know. We think that victims of human trafficking, and this is, you know, for example, this is so marginal issue, probably in Finland, and and we don't need to tackle that. Uh, we think that, you know, probably we just have to close the borders, and the thing is done uh, or then we think that you know this is this is something that um, we just uh, need to somehow to get rid of it you know somehow uh, by by uh, strict uh, legislations and so on and so forth but I think these all these issues uh, are you know are something which relate to that and create opportunities for those who kind of uh, exploit different people. And then of course I think that this impunity and illegal profits are important aspects. Trafficking is uh, trafficking in human beings is 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 committed because of illegal profits. So it generates a lot of money. We know that, and the UN has, has, has actually stated that this is one of those uh, illegal uh, criminal um, um, uh, uh, you know, crimes which generates the most of the criminal profits. So this is, this is uh, uh, in addition to drug crimes and, and, and drug of, of small arms, this is one of those uh, uh, illegal uh, businesses which generates uh, most uh, illegal profits. And, and what, I've, what I've said is that, you know, this is the money we have to find and we have to confiscate that in order to make it difficult uh, and more difficult uh, to generate illegal profits by exploiting uh, uh, victims. And of course, this impunity is something which I would like to say more about, but uh, let's go further because I will come back to that a bit later. So what is needed for a change? Uh, human trafficking is a cross-border problem. Uh, even though that it can take place domestically, it is not enough to, to only co uh, combat trafficking domestically. We need international uh, cooperation and we need European level cooperation. Uh, but at the same time, when we have international and European, for example, international conventions and EU directives and so on and so forth, we need to implement those on the national level. We need to take them seriously and make, you know, do our best in order to implement, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the basically the uh, the measures that have been raised there. And even on the local level, we need to do much more. Uh, Anti-trafficking action is, is very often uh, divided into three sections. So prevention, prosecution and protection. So uh, prevention relates to those activities and measures uh, where we seek to prevent trafficking from taking place uh, in the first hand. Uh, prosecution, we need to, uh, to prosecute, investigate, prosecute and, and sentence those who exploit um, victims of human trafficking. And then we need to assist and protect victims of human trafficking. Um, when we started to, to, uh, to, uh, to discuss what kind of action plan Finland should have, uh, we kind of, uh, kind of, uh, I, I have to say that, you know, um, in order to, to really to have a good plan, we need to have strong political will and commitment from the government. Uh, when you have this kind of a complex, very difficult, uh, multifaceted uh, um, um, social pro problem as trafficking in human beings is, 
it is nearly impossible really to 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 do something uh, effectively without strong political will and commitment and this is now what we have so we have a, a, a government which is strongly committed uh, to anti-trafficking action uh, the government plan has as various uh, measures uh, uh, according to which uh, 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 victims of human trafficking should be assisted better uh, and, and trafficking crimes uh, should be uh, investigated more effectively. So it, can, it gives us a strong basis uh, for, uh, for um, effective action. Of course, then, you know, you have to have some sort of a vision. Where do you want to kind of lead this, this, this country? What do you want to, to kind of a, um, to accomplish uh, by this, this anti-trafficking action? And what I saw, uh, I will come back to this later. Uh, I have still one more slide. Uh, and I, but what is important is that you have to have some sort of a, uh, some sort of a vision uh, upon which the strategy can be based on. But the strategy cannot be based on, uh, I think, anything else but, ex but expertise. You have to have like a strong expertise, uh, really, you know, uh, kind of a, uh, trying to find different people from from different areas uh, uh, of expertise. Uh, you have to, to bring those people together and, and really to discuss what is important when we fight uh, against human trafficking. You have to benefit from research. You have to, to kind of, a, uh, should I say, cherish research and, and, uh, and really that kind of an understanding that human trafficking and action against human trafficking must be based on expertise and research. But we also need funding. We need something which, you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, takes us, uh, you, know, um, you know, closer uh, to those, um, that vision and strategy. You need to have like funding in order to really to do something. You need to have dialogue and cooperation. You need to have like a different people, uh, you know, um, around the same table and even though that they might be they ha might have different views uh, it is important that they that you know the same vision is shared uh, among those people and then of course when you have the action plan you have to implement and supervise how it actually is implemented and and probably also uh, you know to support that implementation in in, in an effective way also, you know, together with those people who actually implement it. And this is my last slide. And, and there is, you know, you are able to see that, you know, how, you know, how I see, you know, what are the elements, what we have to have uh, in our anti-trafficking action here in Finland. I see, for example, that most of the trafficking cases never come to the attention of the authorities. Uh, victims of human trafficking are uh, too afraid uh, to come forward, tell about the exploitation ha they have encountered. Uh, we ha need to have more uh, proactive uh, measures in order to go to the ground and find trafficking cases and trafficking victims. We have to detect trafficking more effectively. And this is why we need to have like police officers, we need to have labor inspectorate, we need to have social and healthcare workers, we need to identify what has happened. It is really, really important uh, to understand that, uh, uh, that victims of human trafficking, they are entitled to be identified. Uh, the, the trafficking, what has taken place is very traumatizing and it is really important uh, for them uh, to to really uh, to come no to 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 become noticed, we also need to have like assistance and protection, which clearly is able to to help these people, uh, um, and and without uh, conditions and thresholds. 
uh, people need to get that assistance as soon as they would be able to take that, uh, you know, to, to really to approve that. We also need disclosure investigation and, and prosecution. So we need to go really, uh, really and, and, and find those cases, but also in, investigate and prosecute those in, in, effectively. We need to find out whether the legislation works or not, how we can kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, to support victims better in the, in the criminal proceedings, uh, how we can, you know, uh, increase the ability and expertise of the police, for example, and, and, uh, and border guard and prosecutors and, and court, uh, courts as well. And then we need, uh, of course, and this is, I think, one of the, the, the difficult, uh, the most difficult uh, parts is to prevent and, and reduce the demand. So we need to have, for example, in the prevention activities, we need to have those people together with us to do this. Uh, com, you know, uh, enterprises, we need to get like uh, different organizations like labor unions, we need to have those people who are able to really to, to go there and, and, uh, and to prevent uh, trafficking. But we also need to, to ask ourselves uh, also and, and reduce the demand uh, of, of, for human trafficking that what, what we can do and, and also how the legislation can, can uh, uh, support that. Uh, partnership and mainstreaming is really important. This, no one is able to do this kind of a thing all alone and and it is it can never be done only in within one administration or something so we need a lot of you know cooperation and coordination uh, we need to do this together with different people within the government but also with NGOs uh, research uh, institutes uh, you know uh, all those uh, and also enterprise companies all those people need to get involved in order to make it really efficient. So, this is what I had in mind uh, as an in introduction, and I would be happy to, uh, to take uh, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Venla, for your informative and thought-provoking presentation. This presentation gave us all many, many things for reflection. And next, we can proceed to the questions. Uh, organized by the organizing team. So Robert, please go ahead and with the first question. Yeah, thank you so much, Ivan. That was um, so informative. Now, um, one question I have about human trafficking is, is there a generational cycle of human trafficking? Yeah, so so you mean that whether, you know, children and so on, you know, are, or what do you mean by generational cycle? Yeah, like um, from one generation to the next, people are yeah. put in a position of dependency, which then leads yeah. to these situations. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, uh, I don't know whether this has been really studied, but what I know is that in, you know, that's kind of a cycle we can see is that victims of human trafficking become perpetrators. So, for example, uh, in the in the in the field of sexual exploitation, it, we see that victims of human trafficking kind of a they become perpetrators themselves. It, can, it, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but it, it happens. This is what we see. All right, thank you. Um, so, Vilma, why don't you go ahead and ask a question next? Yes, thank you, Robert and Venla, for your answer. So I would like to know more about the role of Finnish government in the global anti-trafficking work and what kind of cooperations there are between different countries. And as you say, as Juvenla mentioned, that there needs to be a sharing of research and expertise. So could you please elaborate more how, how this happens in practice? 
with the Finnish government and amongst other countries. Thank you for your question. So global cooperation, uh, yeah, we do a lot of cooperation and many international uh, organizations are very interested in, in combating trafficking in human beings globally. So we have UN, so UNODC especially, uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, which is situated in Vienna, that is really especially um, uh, active in this. Uh, also European Commission. Uh, at the moment, European Commission is, is uh, um, um, adopting or yeah, uh, a new strategy of strategy against human trafficking. And, and we have also cooperated in the drafting process uh, because this is important uh, issue for us at the moment. Uh, and for this government. Uh, also, very, uh, I think, very important uh, partner for Finland is, is, the, is, is uh, other Nordic countries and Baltic countries. And this cooperation is, is regular and uh, we, we try to learn from each other. And actually, Finland is now uh, in, in November organizing uh, a seminar during our uh, presidency uh, in the Nordic Council of Ministers on trafficking in human beings. Um, and, um, and I think also many others. So, for example, OSCE, so Office, uh, you know, uh, so, um, Organization for Security and and cooperation in Europe uh, has been really active in this, this question and we have cooperated with them as well. Uh, uh, and, and ODIA, which is the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights situated in Warsaw, has been assisting Finland now when we are developing a national referral mechanism for victims of human trafficking. Uh, they are, you know, and then of course, Council of Europe uh, has, um, uh, uh, Finland has ratified the Convention uh, on Action Against Human Trafficking, and uh, we are constantly monitored uh, how we implement uh, those, um, that convention. Uh, so they are very, very, very important, you know, important uh, for us as well. So a lot of, you know, a lot is happening around the world. Uh, there are also many others, but this is, just, you know, uh, a few to, to mention at this point. Yes, thank you. It's great to hear that there are commitments from other parties as well, since it is a global complex issue, as you have mentioned. So next, uh, Nonso from our team will provide the next question to Venla. Okay, thank you Venla for joining us today. Uh, it's really good to hear from you. Uh, my question is, you have uh, pointed out severally the complexity of this uh, menace, uh, human trafficking, and how transnational this has been. So what, uh, as agents of change, as, as students of leadership for change, uh, there's, there's a demand on us to act as uh, agent of social change, wherever we may find ourselves. So at the individual level, what do you think we can do to combat this uh, menace? Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, yeah. I think that, and what I've said uh, very often when I'm asked about this, uh, what the individual individuals uh, can do to combat human trafficking, I have said that this is the responsibility of the state. Um, the state is uh, responsible for combating human trafficking and preventing it and assisting victims of human trafficking. But what individual people can do uh, is, of course, to discuss the issue. 
and to ask you know what the government is actually doing about it and i think this is something that uh um what you know what is the role of the individuals as citizens um i don't see that you know uh, it is the responsibility of 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 individuals to to identify victims of human trafficking and refer them to assistance it can happen of course but i think that you know no one is is you know it is even it's hard for even uh, uh, experts to identify victims of human trafficking so i think that um, you can't really expect that uh, to happen uh, on an individual level uh, but i think that of course the other thing is that you know we have to be to certain extent i wouldn't say alarmed but a little bit something like that when we use services and when we use you know uh, labor uh, we have to take into account the possibility of exploitation uh, and and i think that you know by understanding that this can take place in finland we probably would like to choose those services uh, which do not relate to exploitation so what i think is a, is is important to to ask is that you know that your cleaning services in your at your home or you know at your work uh, is provided by by non-exploitative labor or when you go to the restaurant uh, you you kind of a you know you kind of a think that even though it is not the only indication of of you know kind of a exploitation but if it is too cheap you really think that this is something which is really cheap I would think twice uh, without, you know, before I buy that kind of a service. So I think that, you know, by being kind of a, um, uh, attentive to this issue is important. Thank you for your answer. Thank you so much. I think now Mashur uh, will have uh, some questions to ask. Yes. Uh, thank you, Venla, for your insightful speech. Uh, I would like to ask a question. This, do you know the nature and dimensions of human trafficking is increasing day by day around the world. But do you know that, uh, do you think that the world political leaders are failed to find a common platform or lack of policy initiatives to prevent human trafficking? Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things, of course, is that uh, that you know trafficking is not considered as such an societal uh, issue, which would require political attention, um, uh, and this is something which has now you know uh, changed in Finland. Now this, this political will is really strong. Uh, with regard to other reasons, I think there are, there are probably many others uh, uh, why this is so difficult. But one of the things is that when you have like a very strong and very uh, difficult societal problem such as uh, a uh, high level of corruption and 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 poverty uh, uh economic uh, you know uh, desperation uh when you have like uh like uh for example uh, women's uh, position in the society is a very low one or when you have you know this kind of a should i say aspects which kind of a make it easier to exploit uh, you know these persons and people it is something which is very difficult to tackle 
Um, and I have said many times that Finland is a country where we don't have high level of corruption. This we have rather good infrastructure. Uh, we have like a, even though many people disagree today, but anyways, compared to many other parts of the world and many other countries in the world, we have rather high level of, of social welfare uh, society. Uh, we have also rather high uh, gender equality, for example, in Finland. Um, it's not perfect, but it's, it's compared to many others, the situation is, is, is probably better. And what I'm saying is that in Finland, if, if anywhere, <laughs> really, this is important and this is able, we are able to, to combat trafficking in human beings. So you, so I think this kind of a rather, you know, um, should I say complex societal problems makes it even more difficult to combat trafficking in human beings. Okay. Okay, thank you. And I'm the fourth group member and I will be asking my question now. My question is going to come from the perspective of the of the one who is victimizing people, not the victims themselves. You mentioned quite a good number of reasons why someone become a victim of human trafficking. But my question specifically is, is there any specific reasons why is it difficult to stop someone victimizing the victims? That is, for example, is there any loopholes of laws that they are relying on? Or are they very wealthy or are they very powerful that you can know that he or she is doing human trafficking, but you cannot stop them? Yeah, probably different countries have different kinds of problems as well also. And, and I think that in some countries, the corruption is really the big rob is, is really a big problem. And, and, uh, and it is possible uh, to commit trafficking crimes just because of the fact that, that um, uh, authorities do nothing uh, that, can, can, that, can, that can happen. Uh, I think that uh, uh, what you said is, is in a way really important, however, also in the Finnish context. So what we have now uh, trying to achieve is that we try to, to, to develop uh, anti-trafficking action to that kind of a direction where victims of human trafficking, it's easier for them to come forward and resort to the authorities. So what I'm saying is that also in the Finnish legislation and, and different uh, practices, we have those thresholds for victims of human trafficking, which make it harder for them to come forward. Uh, just an example, and this has been also written, uh, has been also uh, discussed in the media. So if you have this kind of a person who has a, a, a work, you know, a, a job and, and a work related uh, a residence permit, it's a hard, you know, it's, it's hard for him or her to come forward and tell about the exploitation without the, you know, that kind of a, you know, without an alternative uh, to stay in the country. So, now what we are doing is that we are introducing a new residence permit criteria for victims of human trafficking uh, or exploitation. So they come forward, they come, come forward and, and apply for that kind of residence permits so that they can stay in the country without uh, being afraid of, of, of deportation. And I think, and this, this kind of a trying to find these ways and trying to find these problems in the legislation and practices is really important to try to understand where the drawbacks really are and then then try to fill them up you know somehow to understand you know the, to, to to you know the, and develop different kind of strategies and measures by which we are able to make it easier for victims of human trafficking to come forward and why I'm saying this is really important also because of the fact that it is not only important for the victims of human trafficking themselves, but it's important for the whole society. 
So if the authorities and the society and the, author, you know, the authorities are not aware of what is happening in Finland, I think it's a very negative thing. So I think that you know, if we are not able to understand that you know, what is happening in the grey economy, what is happening in the ground, uh, I think we are not able to, to really to, to, you know, to, to work against it. And we, we even probably we think that this is a minor problem. So, because the victims of human trafficking don't come forward. So, so in that sense, I think it is really important to to, to try to find where the problems lie and try to solve them. Thank you so much for that detailed answer. And now uh, we would not go for our second round of questions, but we'll allow the audience to ask their questions. So there are a lot of questions on the chat and we will go with that one. So Tia, maybe if you want to ask your question, you can ask it, we start from you, or if you want, we can read the question for you, but it will be nice if you can ask your question yourself. Yes, of course. Um, so thank you, Venla. The lecture has been interesting at this far. Um, I wanted to ask that what is your personal viewpoints on improving the working conditions and labor rights of sex workers, as at the moment in the Finnish legislations considers its, its pairing if two sex workers, for example, rent premises to work, which only makes the job more dangerous as the work needs to be done in private and in hidden places. So if sex work would be a subject for license, the customers could also choose better the, the service provider that they are using. So what do you think about this? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, so I think, um, I think that the current legislation uh, is rather good in Finland uh, with regard uh, to, to prostitution and pandering. Um, I can't see uh, that the example of, of uh, Germany or the Netherlands has been very uh, successful. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the situation in those countries uh, has been even worse uh, and I can't see uh, that licensing brothels uh, would be uh, um, a problem solver in this, this, this question. And I also think that the reason why we have such a strict pandering legislation is important because it also prevents the most ex uh, exploitative trafficking. So I think that this is really important to have both pandering and trafficking uh, uh, criminal offenses uh, in place. Uh, and at the moment, I think uh, there's no need to really to go to, go to the licensing system. I think there should be other kind of uh, ways uh, to, uh, to protect uh, those who sell sex. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now we go to the next one. I can see Dora, your hand was up. If you want to ask your question, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you. All right. uh, thank you, Vanla, for, for uh, being at the lecture today. Uh, you were mentioning uh, profits and money uh, to be a big factor in all of this. So I was wondering whether you think banks, whether they are, and if not, then why not, or should they be? Banks required to, to report, or are they even trained to recognize signs or patterns of, of money, money flows that seem suspicious from a trafficking point of view? Thank you. Yes, it's a very good question. Uh, internationally, this has been taken a, a, a on board, this question of banks and financial institutions. So yeah, so yeah, I agree with you that this is this is something that uh, that we need to, to do as well. Yes, next we can have uh, Isabel Rangel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Okay, so my question. Uh, sorry, just a second. Okay, I think none is working. Is it? Yes, it's good. Oh, no, I don't hear anything. Okay, wait. Uh, okay, maybe it's better if you read my question. Sorry, I, I'm having trouble here in the computer. Okay, no problem. I can do that. The question is, how is the agenda on the stopping work trafficking while people is waiting for their work permits in Finland? You kind of dealt with that one, but I can continue reading. It's a considering that the working permit might take months to be given and people might feel the need to look for a economic source. Yeah, this is a, this is a really important uh, question. Uh, yeah, so what we are now trying to do is that uh, we uh, analyze uh, the application of the current law uh, or, and, uh, and uh, then we consider what we what needs to be done, but now I'm uh, now I'm um, for example what is what what I think is one of the the problems with regard uh, to the to the trafficking related uh, residence permit is that uh, it takes really a, a rather long time uh, for the authorities to to consider whether the person is, is entitled to get that residence permit or not. And, uh, and during that, uh, you know, that kind of a reflection or the, you know, when, when it is considered uh, within the migration services, uh, under the law, the victims of human trafficking do not have a right uh, to work. And I think this is this is this is one of those things that now we have to to consider whether this is uh, this is the way to continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your answer. Sorry about my mic problems. Uh, thank you so much for the question also. And I will go to the next one. Dora, you asked the second question. If that was answered, then maybe I can move to another one. I don't think it was touched upon. Um, okay, yes, you can ask now. Okay, just very quickly because uh, it's a complex problem as you as you introduced, and the Ministry of uh, Interior and the Justice and probably Social Education might be involved. I'm also wondering how the work can be done regarding policies in Finland on international development, technology transfer, or trade, uh, improving the situation for people. Uh, from the origin countries so that they wouldn't become victims and that wouldn't become vulnerable to the trafficking. Thank you. Yeah, this has been discussed also, uh, also, uh, you know, um, by the, you know, the working group uh, developing the, the action plan against human trafficking and with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, for example. So this is this is I think this is really important issue that uh, that needs to be taken into account. Thank you. Now we can move on to Yekaterina. If you are there, you can ask your question. Yes. Hello, everyone. Yes. Uh, thank you, Venla, for your lecture. And thank you everyone for your questions. Um, I would like to ask about the statistics. Uh, Venla, do you know um, about gender ratio regarding human trafficking victims, as well as what are the risk countries? What are the top sort of countries where, where the victims come from? Thank you very much. Your mic Sorry, is your mute. mic is mute. Uh, Sorry. Yes, so, hi. Can so, you hear me? No, you can yeah. me. your question was well understood. Yes, oh, yeah. I heard it. Yeah. Sorry. So I'm, I had a, I, I think that the best source of information would be uh, this one. I will write it down here in the chat. So the National Assistance System uh, publishes uh, twice a year 
uh, statistics uh, on the victims uh, uh, refer to the assistance system. So you are able to see, you know, even even more detailed uh, uh, data from from those statistics. Um, so about women and men. Uh, the number of women is a bit larger than the number of men, but actually in Finland it is. It is, you know, the difference is not that high. Um, that is because of the, you know, probably one one thing what I am uh, and what I've been saying is that what we haven't um, been able to identify so much in Finland this far is that sexual exploitation which takes place in Finland. So we are able to, to identify that kind of sexual exploitation uh, which takes place uh, abroad, for example, in other, you know, in, in, in other European countries, for example, or, you know, when the person is asylum seeker and comes to Finland and, and, and this is, you know, the exploitation as such has taken place some, some, in some other place in some other, other country. But what, you know, what we haven't really uh, disclosed that much is, the, is the, the, that exploitation which takes place in Finland. And, and most of those uh, who are sexually exploited uh, are women or girls, uh, also internationally. So, so that is something uh, that I hope that in the future uh, we are able to detect that trafficking better when we have that police unit established now in the, in, in February. Uh, and um, the other thing that what I would like to say is that we have been rather good at identifying labor exploitation in Finland. So compared to many other Nordic countries, for example, we are rather, you know, or the number of, of those victims who have been uh, uh, exploited at work is rather high and we are able to we, we have been able also to to convict those uh, perpetrators in the labor trafficking uh, rather well uh, especially compared to, to many other countries um, so the number of of, uh, of course you know also women can fall victims of human trafficking for labor exploitation but I think one of the reasons why, you know, this kind of ratio is so, so equal, should I say, is that we have really um, uh, been effective uh, with related to, to labor exploitation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tilda said I can read the question for, yeah, because the mic is not working. So the question is, what is the role of the COE Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings and a special greater, the group of experts for action against human trafficking in Finland? What are the main legislative or political issues in Finland concerning helping the victims? Yeah, the, uh, this, is a, this is a rather big one. So the, the Council of Europe Convention is, is a human rights instrument and and uh, it really kind of, uh, mm, uh, those uh, recommendations that Finland has received has really structured also uh, the work that we do. So Finland, had, uh, Finland has received uh, many recommendations uh, from, the, the, from Greta uh, during, uh, during um, these years. Um, Finland ratified the convention in, in 2012. And after that, we have received two reports uh, from Creta. And I, I would say that in these recommendations uh, have taken really seriously now when we are drafting, when we have been drafting the National Plan of Action. And these uh, recommendations relate to assistance, uh, children, uh, national referral mechanism, uh, um, investigation, prosecution, uh, training and education, and so on and so forth. So the list is rather uh, long. Uh, so, so, 
Uh, what are the main legislative or political issues in Finland concerning helping the victims? Uh, well, now the social and uh, the Ministry for Social Affairs and Health uh, has um, established a working group uh, where I also participate in. Uh, and in that working group, we are discussing how the legislation on victim assistance should be uh, amended. And, and uh, the government uh, has also uh, stated that during this legislative work, we need to improve the status of victims of human trafficking so that victims could and can be assisted uh, uh, without or, you know, with a lesser, you know, con connection with, uh, you know, with the criminal proceedings. So at the moment, uh, the legislation is rather um, uh, difficult in that sense that uh, um, even though victims of human trafficking can be assisted uh, in the system of victim assistance, uh, the right or the entitlement to the that uh, the right to, to to gain services from the assistance system is limited. So um, if the crime uh, is uh, is not kind of a proceeding in the criminal proceedings, the victim of human trafficking can fall outside of the assistance system. And this is exactly what we need to change now. And this is these discussions are now going on. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And before I uh, give floor to Anne, which is on the line to make the follow-up questions to Yekaterina's question, I will just continue with Tilda's question. The second part of the question is, why do you think there are so little court cases on human trafficking in Finland, even though it is widely recognized problem? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, this is this is something that we discussed in a, in a great detail uh, with the working group. That what should we do about that problem? And uh, I think that one of the things is that it's it's not only about the, it's it's not only about the courts that, but it's about the number of of, of cases that you know kind of uh, proceed to the courts. So. <laughs> so, should I say that uh, if we do not detect uh, and disclose trafficking cases, it becomes very difficult uh, to, <laughs> to, to go further, of course. So, what I've been saying and, and what we are now trying to do is, is that we need to detect, we need to disclose trafficking more effectively, we need to get like people to work there on the ground and find the cases. And I agree with those people on the international level who say that the more you look for, the more you will find. And this is exactly what is true with regard to trafficking. Right, thank you. And you can go with your question, your follow-up question. Or should I read it? Sorry, uh, yeah. were you speaking to me? Yes, I'm saying. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you, Venla. Really excellent lecture and, and interesting. I'm, I'm Anni Kangas from the University of Tampere, and thank you especially for highlighting the role of research in, in this problematic as well. It's always for someone who works in academia, it's a pleasure to, to hear that the role of research is is appreciated as well. Well, I only had a question about the, the statistics as well, about the sectors within which this happens in Finland. You, you mentioned that we should be aware or, or wary uh, if, if something is really cheap, for example, and that should already like ring an alarm bell. So what would be, what would be the sectors within which in, in Finland we should be kind of keeping our eyes open and detecting our own responsibility in, in preventing the, the problem? Well, what we know is that, uh, and when we gathered information from uh, from uh, around Finland, so we actually heard uh, 
many multi-sectoral uh, teams and networks in, in various parts of Finland. And what we found out uh, during this, this uh, when we, we drafted the action plan, what we found out is that trafficking in human beings is something which is always on the move. So, so it is something that, even though that this is this is what we know now, it, it transforms. Um, and it makes it, it takes new forms all the time. So what we found out is that even though that we are not able to see those people uh, yet in the statistics, uh, we get like weak signals that this is something that can be and might be uh, a risky sector. So it is difficult to say, really, but I, I think that the, the, uh, the number of, uh, of victims uh, who come to the assistance, assistance system and who we really kind of um, pinpoint and identify, uh, the restaurant sector is, some, uh, is one and cleaning sector is, 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 is another, where, you know, these this, uh, trafficking cases uh, are uh, uh, more kind of a, um, they are anyway, they exist more trafficking cases in those sectors. Um, but there are many others as well. Uh, but um, these are especially problematic, I would say. Thank you so much. And now we'll allow Esko because he's about to go. So Esko, you can ask your question. Your hands is up. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Venla. I'm from Systems Change Finland in the group that's been studying, uh, well, trying to eliminate trafficking in Finland for been working eight months. And uh, your, your, your lecture was really great because it validates a lot of the research that we've been doing, like we're looking at the right thing. But one point I want to ask about is um, it, it's on this detection issue and or like in our language, how do you see the problem? And we see a lot of examples from other countries where actually giving incentives on the society level has yielded really good results. But when you were describing it, um, it you, you mentioned primarily the usual suspects like the police and the you know, border guards, things like that. We know that the training for them for identification has, has been limited in its uh, deployment. And we've also learned that Traffickers and trafficked people are very good at avoiding the gaze of those traditional suspects. So, so the question is, is there an appetite or have there been any kind of initiatives to try to employ the eyes of people outside of the usual suspects in order to do a better job at identification of the problem? Thank you very much. That is a very good question, and and I agree with you. And about that, that you know, this is this is what I tried to say when I talked about mainstreaming that it is not in, it's not only you know those border guard or social and healthcare sector or our police or labor inspectorate uh, that we need to include in the fight against human trafficking um, we need to get uh, also for example teachers uh, uh, language teachers uh, we need to get uh, uh, companies, uh, we need to get labor unions. Uh, and what I think is really, really important is that um, we kind of understand that um, trafficked persons are normal people. So they live like us. Uh, uh, they need same things as we need. Uh, so in a way, what I like, what I would like to say is that they they live and 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 move around us. They live here and where we are. So they are not kind of a locked up somewhere, locked in somewhere, and 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 you know somewhere that we cannot find. And what I'm saying is that clandestine traffic, even though being, trafficking in human beings is a clandestine form of, of crime, I don't mean. Uh, that trafficking is somewhere out of sight. It can be that, but usually it is somewhere we, where we are. You know, we go to the restaurants, we go, you know, uh, 
to the offices where the traffic to persons probably clean. Uh, we kind of, uh, we, you know, they live among us. Uh, and in that sense, it is so important uh, somehow to, um, to understand that those people, you know, who come across with us, they can come across with trafficked persons as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esco, also for even with the basic schedule attending the lectures. We appreciate that. I hope you are not late for your seat. Yeah, bye. So now we will go to the next question uh, that is from Carlos Gomez. Carlos, you want to go ahead now? Should I read it, Carlos? Okay, yes, he said I can go ahead. The question is regarding having more people detecting, detecting victims trafficking. Do you mean having a collaboration with associates like RAM, like PAM, sorry, PAM, and other NGOs alongside the government plan? Yes, I think that uh, especially get labor unions such as PAM is really, really important uh, uh, here. So we need to get uh, these organizations uh, to work with us. And uh, as far as I have understood, they are in, in interested in working with us as well. Uh, also from the employer side, uh, we need people to work with us and organizations to work with us. Uh, for example, now we have um, a project running uh, which is uh, coordinated by the National Assistance System, uh, where we cooperate uh, with the companies and labor unions uh, in order to create uh, job opportunities and uh, for victims of human trafficking, so safe job opportunities. Uh, this is where we need companies as well. We need labor unions as well. We need, you know, this kind of a uh understanding that uh that the state is able to provide like support and assistance and so on and so forth but what victims of human trafficking really need is is sustainable uh, uh sustainable solutions so work safe work safe living uh their family around them and so on and so forth so th in that sense they need the same things as, as we do as i said before uh so in that sense the sustainable solutions something like that is is really something that i would like to 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 uh, to promote um even more in the future um anyways we have now that project and i'm ha very happy about that um so, and what about the NGOs? NGOs are uh, critical uh, partners uh, with the work in, in the work against human trafficking. So those, those are the, you know, the, the NGOs are those who actually come across with the most vulnerable victims of human trafficking. Uh, they, they kind of, uh, uh, well, they, they assist victims of human trafficking, they identify victims of human trafficking. And from the government's perspective, they also serve as a bridge between the, the victim of human trafficking and, the, and, and, and for example, the authorities. So, so they, in a way, they kind of, uh, they, they are closer, they work closer to the victims. So they are in a, in a, in a better position often uh, to come across with the most vulnerable uh, people. And sometimes the victims of human trafficking, they are afraid of the, of the authorities and they have, should I say, good grounds for that as well. Uh, you know, they, they probably have some bad experiences, for example, uh, uh, of authorities in, in their home countries or, or, or uh, even in Finland, I don't know, but you know, the thing is that um, it is important that the NGOs kind of create that trust and tries to create the trust uh, to the victims that, that Finland is able to assist them. So the work with NGOs is really important. And, and uh, for example, in our working groups, we had four 
NGO uh, representatives uh, when we drafted the action plan. Thank you so much. And we can go to the next one. I can see Dora's hand is up again. So Dora, you can go ahead. We have time. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just wondering uh, your follow up answer to, to Esco's question. Uh, I'm just picturing the situation that you are in the a Finnish person is going into the office and there is a foreigner cleaning, right? And, and now I'm focusing on the labor exploitation side. Uh, we all know that it's hard for foreigners to get employed in Finland. And we also know that the government is pushing work based immigration only for highly qualified, highly educated people uh, in the IT sector or wherever. So I'm just wondering, is there a connection here possibly with the attitude that if somebody is a foreigner, they are only welcome in Finland if they are doing high quality knowledge work and how that impacts the interaction, right? So even if I was working in that office and there was a, as a Finnish person and there was a, a foreigner cleaning, would I even try to interact with them? Or I wonder if you are, if you get my question, like the, 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 this attitude that might be existing in in the in the society, and and whether that has any connection to to this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, you know uh, what I take from your question is, uh, and and what I what I probably would like to say here is that. Um, I think it is really um, uh, worrying that uh, we have uh, uh, I don't know if it's stronger, but probably more vocal anti-immigrant uh, attitudes and and should I say movements in Finland. Um, this uh, intolerance towards immigrants uh, is, of course, something uh, which has an impact also uh, on trafficking uh, and also the ability of the state to work against it. So when we have right like a rather positive sentiment towards immigrants uh, we are i think we are able to achieve uh in the anti-trafficking field also um also that kind of a human rights based approach and 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 that kind of uh solutions which would uh not only uh, protect victims' rights, but also uh, probably uh, support uh, and promote the detection uh, of human trafficking when victims of human trafficking are not that afraid of the authorities. And we have like solutions for them uh, to offer. So now we are luckily in the situation where uh, the government really finds and tries to find ways uh, to promote victims' rights and detect trafficking. Uh, so I think that we are now in a in a very good position uh, to actually achieve uh, uh, a lot in the tra anti-trafficking work. All right. Thank you so much. And next question uh, is from Camille. Very interesting question. So Camille, maybe you want to ask yourself. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, if you could elaborate on the impact of the COVID crisis on human trafficking. So for example, I know it's uh, more difficult, for example, to, to spot uh, a victim because, for example, they are the measure regarding lockdown. But um, I also wanted to to know what the impact on the side of the recruitment of the victim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, we know um, about some research done uh, on the COVID uh, 
and how it has uh, and what kind of impact it has had on the trafficking business and, and, and trafficking and the exploitation and the victim's position and, and um, vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, the uh, internationally done the OSCE and the ODEA and ODEA and also uh, the UN Women uh, just uh, published a study on this and for example one of the findings was that that the trafficking business has uh, um, has been transferred more to the, to the internet so it's more about pornography and and something like that and uh, people move uh, across borders less so it has uh, has had an impact on on the trafficking uh, uh, business so yeah it it probably has had an impact but i think that it can be so that we need more research on that uh, before we can say anything certain but at least that study is something that we know uh, about and i found it very interesting uh, that can be that can be found uh, in the internet. All right, thank you so much. And since there is no question now, uh, okay, uh, Yasaman, you want to ask? You just raise your hand up. Yes. Yes, uh, do that quick. Thank you for the lecture. I have one question, like personally, if if I notice that like around me there is a case that some we. I feel like there is someone um, getting exploited or something. How can like I reach and approach it? And what are the ways that they can uh, seek for help if they need? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, we have the national assistance system. That was the the, the email address or the no the email address, the internet website that I gave. Uh, just uh, just a uh, while ago, and uh, and then of course the NGOs. If it if it is uh, too much to ask from the victim of human trafficking, that that can be uh, to contact the authority first. Uh, they can also contact, uh, for example, um, the NGO. So for example, this um, I will write it down here. Rikotsuhri Päivystys uh, operates also in the in the Tampere area, so I think that probably they they could they could be a, a good contact point, and if 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 it is uh, related to sexual exploitation, uh, then I would probably uh, um, let's see, I would contact Protokipiste and they also uh, uh, operate in, in the Tampere area. So I think that, you know, what, what needs to be done is that uh, if you have this kind of a suspicion, suspicion that the, the person is probably victim of human trafficking, you can of course discuss this with her or him. Uh, but what I also find very important is that those people who are experts uh, in helping and assisting victims of human trafficking, uh, they can uh, probably discuss and speak with the victim. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we will go to our last question, which is going to come from Camille. You can go ahead and ask your question. Um, I wanted to ask you, since you said uh, because of COVID, uh, pornography or internet um, exploitation is rising. I'm just wondering if it's going to worsen the situation, especially for women, because uh, I think that the majority in the sex industry to be exploited. So um, I just wanted to have um, a gender-based uh, perspective. And also I wanted to ask if in general, women are, and girls are more um, the victims because they are more hit by poverty or because there is especially a demand for, for women and girls. Uh, 
girls? Yeah, it hits women and girls, especially, and and also to a certain extent, uh, boys and and um, so uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's that's true uh, that it's it hits women and girls mostly. All right, thank you so much. Before I hand over to Robert for the closing remark, what is there going to be any words that you're going to leave? Uh, us with or how can we help in this course as a leadership for change students? I don't know if I if I can can you repeat the question? I said uh, is there going to be any closing remarks from your side? I'll, I'll oh okay advice to leadership for change students and how can we actually be part of this course? Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, what I would like to say is that uh, I I was very pleased to to speak about trafficking with you today, and uh, this was a great discussion. And I very much appreciate uh, these questions and this active participation as well. Uh, this was a pleasure for me. Uh, and what I would like to say uh, to you is that, as, as far as I know, uh, many of you are students and, and, um, and probably something, something personal. <laughs> I would like to say uh, uh, just in the end. I kind of uh, would like to encourage you uh, to, to really to, to work in the future. Also with you know, complex societal issues and, and try really to do your best in order to, to, to make world better place. Uh, so I think people are needed in order to, to make the change happen. And I hope that I was able to give you some sort of insights uh, how the change can be made, but also encourage you that that you know um, that um, it is really something which uh, is important. It is inspiring. Uh, it is important in that sense that it gives you know not only to the society kind of a you know, ways to deal this issue, but also it's personally really motivating and inspiring to work with issues like this. So this is something I wanted to say to you. So welcome on board. Thank you so much. Thank you. Robert, you can go ahead and be more. All right. Well, this was just a great experience today. And um, we want to thank everyone for coming out and also, we would like to give a very special thanks to our guest lecturer, Venma Roth. So we feel very privileged to have such a professional as you here today discussing this crucial matter. Let's all take a moment and give a little round of applause for Venya. So please put your microphone on and let's do a little better. All right, thank you, Venla. Um, by the way, everyone, we will be publishing a blog soon. So based on this lecture today, you can find it posted to the official master's degree program in the Leadership for Change blog. Lastly, um, the fourth and final Leadership for Change lecture this year will take place on the 26th of April from 16 to 18 p.m. The guest lecturer is Maya Kevela of the um, Left Alliance and former executive director of Anna Amelia. So be sure to come out for that one as well. Well, that's all for today, everyone. Um, thanks once again, and we wish you a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.